this week has just been like a, a everything came out perfect week for economic data. It was like across the board, uh, pretty much you couldn't have asked for a better week for in terms of economic data. What I mean by that? Well, like which data points am I thinking of? Well, take your pick. We had several that were really good this week. I want to just recap for a second what I'm thinking about on this front. We're going to go through some data here. It is Friday. So, you know, markets could still be moving today, but probably less so than the rest of this week. Today is a big day for gold. Look at this. We got all time highs on the gold price. Wow. You know what gold did? You got to do the sound. That's what gold did this morning. Big Hulk green candle to the upside. Really, really um, impressive. I actually did not think that would happen today. I'm not short on gold, but I also don't have any long positions on gold. Yesterday's data was was very confident for the economy. So I'm wondering, does anybody know if something happened in the Middle East or if there's a catalyst here? I also noticed that oil is down 1.77% here this morning. You know, that's that's nothing to ignore. I was a big slide on oil, so that would actually tell me maybe there's not geopolitical stuff attached to this. Maybe this is... Um, I mean, it's possible the rate cuts are just coming and people are just bullish on gold and we just see higher lows, higher highs, and we see a breakout. I'd love to see... love to see this thing close strong today if we get a nice close above all-time highs if we get an all-time closing high atch right we've had lots of intraday all-time highs recently an all-time closing high would be nice that would show you that bulls are strong enough to actually hold these gains i mean gold looks really really strong i gotta say what a nice breakout here and a nice higher low Right, little four hour retest of support. Man, if I had a dollar for every time we saw this this pattern, I guess I don't even need to get a dollar if I, I could just trade these events. But look at this. It's so frequently that this happens where you get a big level of resistance forms and on the third try, price steadies at these levels, briefly pulls back and it's like one last fake out before the push. I've seen that pattern in my trading career so many times. It is such a bullish sort of formation. When you see highs being formed, you have to start thinking about this uh, from a price action, like a simple price action. If this market is so bearish, why is it that every time it comes up here, the sellers, yes, they come back in, but why aren't sellers actually making any ground? They're just having short-term little sell-offs before buyers step in aggressive. Here we are. We've almost hit the 2,500 mark, which if you guys remember, I've been talking about that's kind of like my yearly target now for a while. And it looks like it looks like it's going to get there. 2,500 does not seem out of the question. Again, I'm not currently long, but I've caught a lot of the upside this year on gold. I'd love to see if I can catch a retest on the lower time frames. I apologize, gold. I'm sorry. I should have just bought you, but I didn't. And again, people will get scared. People people will say, Nick, so you're telling me you want to buy it up here? And the answer is yes. I'm a momentum trader. When you're, when you're a momentum trader, when you're a trend follower, if you really think a trend is trending well and has good backing, there is no such thing as it's too high for me to place a trade. Now, there is such thing as saying it's too high for me to invest in, but that's different. That's different. Okay. So here's the thing about me personally, when I'm investing versus when I'm trading two different stories, when I'm trading, I like to buy things that are going up. When I'm investing, I like to buy things that are going down. There's two different stories here. When you see value, that's when I look to invest. When I look to, like when I see a really great company, like I bought, um, and this is going to be a hard case to make, 
because this is not really a value trade or investment. But I bought Nvidia recently. I bought Google, and although you know a value investor would would you know hit me across the face for saying this, those are not value uh, stocks because they're priced very very richly. But it's kind of a mix for me with investing. Like I'm looking for things that are growing, but also, you know, giving me discounts. I like to buy stocks at discounts. I like to long-term invest in stocks on discounts. That's the only time I buy them. But when I'm trading, when I'm trading, here's the difference. When I'm trading, I don't like to buy things that are crashing. I don't like to short things that are ripping. So shorting gold this year has not even been on my radar. And thank goodness, because if you've been shorting gold this year, it's not been fun, right? It's been rough. This this chart has been so bullish. It's been so strong. There is nothing for me here to make a case for a short term. I think it's going down bet. I just don't see it. For me, short term, it's going up. It's trending up. The fundamentals look good. And I'm not saying I'm not saying, oh, it's certainly going up from here. That's that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the directional bias for me here on this chart is and has been up. So if you said, oh, gold is too high over here or gold is too high over here, look what's been going on. New highs have formed for a very, very long time. If you're somebody who says all-time highs are bearish, I want you to take a good look at this chart. You know what else I want to show you? If you're somebody who says I, I'm, you know, all-time highs, I'm going to short them, look at the NASDAQ and you tell me, how many times all-time highs were bearish compared to bullish, right? Come on. If, if, if you just bought the NASDAQ every time it hit an all-time high, now obviously this is hindsight because you're looking at a really great period in the stock market, but in this last 10, 15 years, if you bought all-time highs only, you made tons of money. Are we on the same page with this? Does this make sense? Because, again, I hear it all the time. Amateur hour is saying, oh, it's at all time highs. It can't go any higher or it's all at all time lows. It can't go any lower. Today is the last day of our 30% off VIP Discord sale. Inside the VIP Discord, you get access to real-time trade signals from Trader Nick, Frank, and Ivan, with complete trade details including analysis on the reasoning behind the trades, their entries, exits, and stop losses. Our traders cover a wide variety of assets including gold, oil, and other commodities, forex trades, option trades, and even stocks too. We have active chat rooms filled with traders from all over the world discussing their trade ideas as well. Plus, you get access to our exclusive strategy guides and VIP webinars for joining. All of this incredible trading content is available right now for 30% off, and it's a one-time purchase. So grab it now on sale using the promo code down below before it's too late. I know you heard a little bit of what I was saying there. Do you feel similarly? Do you feel differently? What are your thoughts on the Russell? So. I, I, I mean, I think the Russell still has the best opportunity for a catch up trade. We're about to see, you know, how strong this market truly is. Um, I'm not quite, you know, convinced yet that uh, we're just going to see all time highs right away after, a, you know, I mean, it's not going to be a two week recovery, but it's mm -hmm. been a two week recovery by three weeks. Does this thing just keep ripping to the upside? I mean, one thing that we keep talking about, you know, I know, I know we've talked about this offline quite a bit. Um, we're coming into a period that isn't historically bullish for the market. No. So I also, I did a video yesterday and I talked about it a lot last week. If we pull back to 70%, which is where we are at, we're just around that 70% handle. So this high to low swing, we pull back 70%. A lot of times when the market gets to that number at a 70% pullback, to me, this is more of a wedge that could be starting. And mm -hmm. it would make some sense to me that the market would just have maybe a sluggish, not necessarily bearish, but a stall or a sluggish September. Um, if the and, and one thing that we mentioned too, Nick, is what's what does the market do when the Fed actually cuts? Is this a buy the rumor, sell the news situation where when the Fed actually cuts in September, has the market topped out? And I don't think that's necessarily the case, but for the Russell to get to all-time highs, which I'm still playing, by the way, mm -hmm. um, we have to see everything go up. So what we haven't had this entire year is we haven't had the SPY and the Qs and the Dow and the Russell going to all-time highs. 
We yeah. had the Dow hit all-time highs earlier. Yeah, they've we taken the the it's, it's been like a fragmented index where it's it's one or the other or the Qs and the SPY are pretty much the same now because it's heavy tech and it's you know your top top 10 or mag 7 stocks. But the Dow is its own island. The Russell is its own island. That weird rotation we saw in late July with the Russell that poked up during FOMC and then ultimately just gave it all back. I mean, I, I'd like to say that it's still a good value play, but we have to see growth out of all the indexes we have to see you know sustained bullishness out of all the indexes for the russell to get to 244 245 look i'd love to see it there but yeah. i realize that my trade is i mean i, I want to say the trade that i took on the russell let me go ahead and bring one of these accounts up here so russell trade iwm um what do i have here in the money i got that in the money uh actually this expires today i'm gonna have to close this one out dude uh, 1346 and that's trading for intrinsic art. That's fine. My trade that I'm in, I have a 240, mm -hmm. uh, by 270 and then I have a 245 by 270. So I'm trying to get from this, like, you know, 200 area 210 area. I'd love to see this thing at 240 because I, I paid very little for that, for that option. But I'm hoping that if I get it to be at the money or close to it, then, you know, I turn a, what was my debit on this one? Uh, 240. Let's go IWM here. So I turned a, where's my debit at? Okay, so a $7 debit could be trading for like 20 to $30 if I get yeah. something in the money. Yeah, and see so the thing- That's a trend I'm willing to take. The thing that's interesting to me with, with the Russell idea in general, Chris, is that you just mentioned how it's on its own island. There is this possibility where we enter, maybe we just go back, let's rewind six, eight weeks ago where it was like, Two week period where tech and megatech was down, yeah. and Dow stuff and you know you know the defensive stuff was just getting bought. There's a possibility that we do enter this rate cut thing, and as you're talking about, there's like the uncertainty about the S and P. Maybe we do go back to the highs. Maybe we just maybe the market gets shaky up here, yep. and it's a, a tennis match where it's like, well, are we going to get good rate cuts or bad rate cuts? Or, well, we know we're going to get rate cuts. <laughs> Meanwhile. What does the Russell do on rate cuts? It just goes up, right? Yeah, that's it just, true. It doesn't care what what um, you know. It wants to see the economy do well, yes, but it really uh, a known factor for the Russell is that if you get a lot of rate cuts, it's at least a positive thing for it, right? So, so you got the rate cut story, which is you know arguably just good for companies like the Russell, which especially their their price to earnings ratio is much lower on average than the higher names, mm -hmm. the S&P and NASDAQ, they can debate endlessly as to whether or not rate cuts are, you know, going to come in slow or fast. Russell might just, I, I could see an environment where we get a couple months where tech is just kind of like this and Russell actually has a little bit of a catch up, not by necessarily everything is good and everything is ripping and small caps are ripping the most. That's possible, but maybe you get an environment where everything else kind of just chills out and the Russell just kind of has a good period because rate cuts are coming. I don't know. Could be something to think about. Well, what we what we have seen is that it's very capable of going way faster than the other yes. indexes. I mean, we, we could see 15 or 20% upside while the others are maybe returning single digits. Mm -hmm. that, that's very possible. So for us to be sitting here at 212 um, and, and looking at 212 up to 240, uh, that's a 15% rip to the upside. We could we could have the the spy or have the S and P and the net and the Nasdaq just returning maybe three to five percent, but the Russell could absolutely get that you know fifteen percent level, hit the all time highs. I mean, for me, that's my target. I don't know if I'm really holding you know small caps longer than that because that to me is sure. a good measured move. Um, but I, I'll say this: let's let's clean up my charts. Just uh, my charts are super messy right now. <laughs> um, if we go to let's go to this guy here. Ugh. I got way too much stuff in my charts, Nick. Um, <laughs> let me try to get something clean. All right, here's one. All right, so let's go IWM and let's zoom out to the weekly. What we are not seeing right now is lower lows. So I will give the Russell the benefit of the doubt and say, unless we break this low, I'm still going to be cautiously optimistic, cautiously bullish. You know, it was a awful setback that we saw mm -hmm. from that sell-off in yep. july you know late july early august uh, it was a terrible setback for the russell but did it do any structural damage no not right now so i mean we, we came right back to the same level at 197 but it saved itself right there we're, we're about you know roughly 50 percent uh back pulled back on that sell-off 
Now I want to see, okay, if, if we just high, low kind of chop around in here, we're mm -hmm. going to see if this market can still make another thrust to move to the upside. Because if it does, we're talking 240, 245, and this just higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, a lot of volatility, but it still stays the course with higher lows. So technically it's not broken. And like I said, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt until it proves otherwise. And to add to your concept about the speed at which the Russell can move, guys, why, why are we even paying attention to the Russell when we could be talking about S&P, NASDAQ, gold? I know there's people in the audience who are thinking that, but listen to what Chris just pointed out about the speed of this thing. When it makes a move, let's rewind the clock back to late 2023, yep. where Goldilocks actually looked very real. I fully bought that story. I was wrong about it, but it looked like we were going to get a smooth, you know, consistent 2024 of, of rate cuts throughout the entire year. And at that time, employment was heating up like employment was solid. And we saw inflation cooling at the same time. That's the sort of environment where, you know, good old baby Russell, you know, you put a spoon in its mouth and it does incredible. Look at what happened. It was up 27 percent in a few short weeks. It was insane that that is 64 days. It was up 27% at an index level. Obviously, that's after a big drop. But the point is, uh, and I think a lot of people might have gotten really disappointed to what you just talked about, Chris. There was like this, there it goes again. Russell up 14% in a few weeks. Rotation trade is in. And then, boom, we got smacked with a little bit of humble pie and Russell came all the way down. Probably scared a lot of people who are just throwing up their hands. I'm done with this. I'm not waiting on it anymore. But I'm telling you, and, and as you just pointed out, when it makes its move, you know, we'll see all time highs at the blink of an eye at some point. Uh, it could be now, could be a year from now. But when it happens, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen very quickly. It won't be like a gradual, like we're going to grind 1% very, very slow at a time. Right. It'll be a rapid jump. And uh, some of these big days for the Russell, let's think about this. You know, Russell on a good day is up better than 3 4% in a single day, which at an index level is pretty wild. It, it is it is wild and that and that's that's the exciting thing about it i mean i i would feel a lot better about my 240 and 245 levels if we just get past 228 um but yeah i mean again like i said i'm, I'm just gonna I, I had i had a lot of kind of discoveries this week i was i was frustrated with you know immediately going to defensive mode putting in some hedges you know out to august out to september i had a good conversation this morning on the yen pairs um let, let's let's switch over here let's finish up on the russell I'm going to keep the Russell as is, you know, benefit of the doubt. We haven't done any real technical damage to the downside. And then yep. let's just keep it clean on the SPY as well. Have mm -hmm. we done any technical damage to the downside? You can look at this and say no. I mean, we we actually are sitting here with a higher low after a 10% correction on the SPY. We haven't done any technical damage to the downside to take out this low from April. Now, could this mean that we go, you know, up and up and up and up? I mean, there is something called a three drive pattern, which if this is one, two, three, four, five, that could set up our turnover, you know, bearish pattern coming in later. But that's probably something that happens in, you know, Q1, Q2 of 2025 and beyond when it's like a whole new batch of problems versus what we have right now. Yep. So, uh, you know, the SPY looks pretty clean right now. I would like to see just an acknowledgement that we don't just have a instant V bottom, which it, it, this, this might be in, in my career, one of the only V bottoms that I've seen without the Fed having something to do with it. Right. That is an insane, insane move. I yeah. we talked about that a little bit yesterday, just over DMs. Yeah. Chris, I want to add something to your your thought there with the S P too. You know, here's the weird thing about and and this was more of our discussion that we had through DMs yesterday, just the idea that like, okay, so as, as you mentioned, the three, you know, three time pattern, that three mm -hmm. push. If you get another push, what I think that takes us into and this is just a, a secular guess that I've been talking about. And you and I have discussed this all year long. We talked about, is this just going to be a wild melt up year where you kind of just have to hold on to your butts and then, yep. then it, it turns into a 2021. I think if you get another, if you get that craziness happen where we just rip through the highs, I think we enter into the final era of a bull market, Agree. which is the far out risk curve thing that I always talk about. Basically, the idea is that during the first waves, you know, people go to what they know is like a stable bet. They buy like technology. You know, 2023 was the year of tech massively. The year two, they start getting into, you know, financials. They start getting comfortable with rounding out the full market. But whether it's, I'm not saying year three is not what I mean, but like the next push, the next wave of a bull market 
especially with the trajectory that we have been moving in, I would not be surprised if rate cuts start to happen. We see going out, buying houses, people buying crypto, money starts flooding in from those money markets. And we see the final wave of a crazy bull market, which is crypto, um, unprofitable tech stocks, the ARK Invest, you know, 101. Yep. We might enter into that era and it is a frustrating era uh, because for me as an investor, what that means is I get no, I get to do nothing. Because I, right. I told you this, Chris, I have a personal rule I've talked about on YouTube. I only like to buy stocks when they're at 10% plus off on the S&P 500 level, which is a rule that is really nice when it works and really frustrating when it, you can't buy anything. So right. I might just be trading it for a while and riding it off a cliff of whenever that happens. But uh, I definitely don't claim to know where the top of this move is. I just think it's worth thinking about, like, if we get another wave higher, is it kind of like an annoying thing? Yeah, it's like this, this market has no chill. But maybe we just enter the frenzy final wave of, of risk on environments. Yeah, I, I think that's that's very accurate. Um, you know, we look, we have talked about maybe 6,000 is an achievable profit target for the year. I mean, we're sitting here at uh, we were 18 plus percent year to date, correct, from from the highs we saw back in July. If we get up higher than that and we, we enter into like, you know, 20 some percent, I mean, I think from the start of the year, if we went up to 6,000, I want to say that's like right at 20, maybe 23% for the year. Let me try to get this on the, uh, this is a weekly chart SPX. Uh, we're here at the beginning of the year. So I, I know that we had like a one, a wild one and a half percent pullback to start the year. <laughs> uh, yep. But right in here, if we go to 6,000, 26% in the year, we've, we've had several, several, several years. Yes. Uh, I mean, my gosh, we probably had maybe a half a dozen in the last 20 years that we've had 20 plus percent on the index. So it's it's not far fetched to think that with an election year, with kind of the soft landing, the Fed gets it right, they thread the needle, we could definitely have a 20 plus percent year, which means, I mean, I know you trade a lot of tech and you like you like the NASDAQ. I mean, we could see 30 plus percent on the NASDAQ. Yeah. But as we get to those levels, it's hard not to think that, I mean, again, the dumbest thing is to call is to call the top, but I think the next potential leg lower is not going to be a V bottom type move because we've had a pretty crazy stretch. And you know, I know yeah. you and I talked about this offline. I think what frustrated me this week is just thinking about this market just can't have steady anything it, like from 2018 to now it has been booms and busts yeah. and booms and busts and no highs patience. and lows. Instant gratification. Only. Ugh, it so is frustrating. Bad. Like, and yeah. that's the thing, Chris, is if we yeah. take out those highs, from as you mentioned where i'm positioned obviously i'd be happy because i'm i'm long tech and smh sure. and all the but from a investing standpoint um frustrating because it's like I, this market never has you know 2022 i gotta say i, I mean was a painful year for me but also at least it gave me a chance to really seriously deploy large amounts of capital that i had been waiting to invest for a long time yeah. and that ended up being a great you know thing in the long run but um Man, uh, it is frustrating because I, I don't invest in environments like these. I only trade. And that is just a personal, uh, I'm not saying that's what you should do or shouldn't do. That's just what I do is I only invest in long-term stocks that I like when I feel that the market is is at a discount. Look, all we're doing is talking about the same thing the Fed has been giving us all year, which is, you know, hey, we think it's appropriate to cut rates. Uh, this has jumped around a lot, Frank, the last couple of weeks. We went from, I mean, if you looked at the CME watch tool, we saw at one point, it was a week ago, uh, there was a 75 basis points cut here in like a low probability, uh, but it was on it was on the chart. And then we had the higher probability of 50 basis points. And then we had the lower probability at 25 basis points. That, of course, is all flipped. Now the 75 is off the table, right? The 50 is low probability. And the market's like in line with the fact we're going to have one cut uh, in September. Now, it's still planning out here that we have a cut in September, cut in November, and cut in December. I still think November is an interesting time to do it, but doing 25 basis points each, we go out to another year. Uh, we're looking at something around like 2% in cuts over the next uh, 12 to 50, let's say 12 to 16 months. So that's good. Um, but I think you and I talked about this yesterday. There's a lot of news that we're still going to be able to digest. I thought it's like, well, it's pretty quiet till, till um, you know, Jackson Hole. But there's a lot of stuff, dude. We still get through unemployment claims every week. We still get through Jackson Hole, which is next week, Thursday through Saturday. We also get through PCE at the end of the month. We kick off a non-farm payroll. Um, I was looking at the Edge Finder this morning. And I, let, me, let me ask you this. Do you think that the data trends 
are looking good for labor. If we go to inflation data, we're sticky at 2.9. If we go to uh, employment numbers, where am I, where's my employment stuff here? Let's go labor, labor data, NFP and unemployment claims. So we have trended slightly lower. This prints every Thursday. We've had slightly low, un, lower unemployment claims, but NFP, even from this February 2024, it's been trending lower in a big way, dude. I mean, I, I don't see that the market, I mean, the market got super excited these last two weeks with just having not crappy news print, but are we going to continue to see like good news out of the US? What are your, what are your thoughts on that versus what I'm seeing here? Like trend wise, I think we're still pointing at like a struggling labor market. I any think, thoughts? I think it's, I don't really look at NFP right now just cause it's so wild. I, okay. I just focus more on, un, on a, the unemployment rate. Yep. Uh, if that ticks higher, which which higher. Been, yep. that's more concerning to me. I'm watching it now specifically because it's over 4%. Mm -hmm. Before it wasn't too much of a concern and NFP was just all over the place. The revisions were very wild and inaccurate. And, and so it, it just wasn't reliable for me and it just caused so much volatility in the short term that I don't really... I don't really want to follow that. So looking at the longer term trend of unemployment rate rising, um, especially that jump we had last time mm -hmm. was pretty concerning. So I don't think that uh, the jobs market is necessarily getting better. I think it is cracking. Mm -hmm. uh, and the longer we hold up above 4%, I think the worse it's going to be. So uh, what we talked about yesterday was we're holding on to anything we can or we're grabbing onto any good news that's out there. So unemployment claims, if they're better than, or if they're lower than expected, which is a good sign, the market takes that and runs with it. But I think we just got severely oversold in the short term and people are just looking for any reason to get back in. Um, but it doesn't change the fundamental aspect that the labor market is not doing well. And CPI is not doing that much better either i mean we're not really trending lower oh it's 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 been 12 months sticky man like uh, two two point nine is i just i mean i'll, I'll quote shania twain that don't impress me much you know it's, it's about the same thing <laughs> so we have um you know unemployment rate too it's like so if you look at unemployment rate it's trending higher you look at wage growth it's trending lower you look at unemployment claims it's steady you look at non-farm it's all over the place but it's been trending lower since february i mean i i I, I question it that, uh, you know, how much better does it get? And there's enough of it that before the September 18th meeting, and, and look, I don't think that any of this is going to change the Fed cutting rates. I think the the worst sign, and, and we've all talked about this, right? The worst sign right now would be from now until the Fed cuts in September, on September 18th, the worst thing the Fed could do is cut more. Cut 25 basis points and let it do its thing, as opposed to showing the market and showing the world that you misstepped, you miscalculated, and now you're going 50 basis points. Now you're overcutting. I, th I think that rocks the market more to the downside than it does the upside. I think that really would like, we put a top in if the Fed's gonna do anything beyond what's forecasted right now. I think 25 was what's expected. That would be like the healthy cut, it's appropriate. But if we're losing the labor market in the background and the Fed starts getting more aggressive, I think that's like that, I, I don't know, for the first time in a long time, it might be a failed backstop. Yeah, so, but why would 25 be appropriate when inflation is still sticky. I know you were talking about the well, labor market. If it, if it's 25, look, zero cuts are appropriate. If we want if we want to make sure that there is a, you know, 99.99% chance that inflation doesn't rear its head again and have an uptick in inflation, which we've never cut. done, by the way, all of our inflation in the US has always had a second wave. So is this, and I was telling, uh, I think Nick and I talked about this offline. I said, is this the first regime ever to, to officially squash inflation for, for good? And part of me thinks that it's no, like part of me thinks that they might want to squash inflation, thinking that it's, it's, it's gone down low enough, but it really hasn't. They really shouldn't cut rates at all. But if we don't cut rates, you're going to kill the consumer because the consumer can't keep living life with debt the way that we are. We, I mean, our government does it, but we can't do it. We can't stretch our consumers out by another 12 to 16 months with zero cuts, you know, 8% financing on auto and you know 7% mortgages and the refis are crazy like months. business restructuring is, is it's it's all bad that's you know? it's very short term if we just let this unfold 
if we keep bringing back like this temporary relief, we just prolong this process. I, so it's not like this does. problem isn't going to come back again. In the future. But that's but that's what's been happening, right? It's always it's always going to be a problem. And since 2018, it's been a problem. We have booms and busts, and it's been the Fed is it the Fed is front and center at every up and down cycle that we've seen. And this is why I think that the Fed ultimately something breaks and the Fed has to come in and fix it. And like I said, my biggest concern is that the Fed comes in and they can't fix it. They won't fix it or it gets way worse before it does finally it's finally like bottom out. So um, I, look, I think the ideal thing to do would be consumers need to cut back. We need to have a contraction. We need to have a recession and people just need to figure it out. Let let the let the market do it as opposed to the Fed's going to cut inflation's good enough. But it's it, as you and I just said, it's really sticky. And somehow we have a wave up in inflation. And then what happens now we're down to let's say if, if the if the if the CME watch tool is accurate. OK, and we're talking about this same conversation in September of 2025 and the Fed just continues to cut to three percent. And inflation still at 2.7, 2.6, 2.5, 2.4, maybe 2.9. How does that look? If our if our Fed funds rates at three to three and a quarter, and inflation still at three percent. Now now we're right on the verge of like losing it. We're right on the. I mean, so that's where things get really ugly. It's like the Fed's starting to cut. They probably will cut. And if it starts, I don't think they stop. You know, I think they'll cut 25 basis points and they stretch it out every quarter. But I don't know, man. It. This is this is the difficulty of like how this all fundamentally plays out, and the le the the level of confidence I have in the Fed to get this right and thread the needle. I think they can get through this year because it's an election year and it's not not as disruptive. If they cut now and they cut you know through the election and just say we plan on doing it anyway, maybe the market's okay with it. But if something turns nasty, employment, inflation, and the Fed just keeps cutting and making things worse, um, I think that stagflation is a true a true conversation. Right. I mean, Stagflation is worst now. case scenario for our economy. That's kind of what we're seeing now. If inflation yeah. continues to not move, um, hopefully it doesn't go higher. But if what was it like 12 months of CPI in the same range it's been? Yeah, we've been we've then, been sticky for a year, right around 3%. It has it has not budged. If meanwhile, we unemployment to... trending higher, NFP ultimately lower. It's yep. hard to see the trend on NFP, but it's just down. I mean, the last five or six months has been it's been past, down, right? Yeah, yeah it's the been past it's six months are lower. Are lower but, yep. um, and most of the jobs have been government jobs, not private sector. Yeah. So most so of the government not, jobs. Yeah, it's not great. Did you know we do a live trading show Monday through Friday with guests from all over the world? To get notified when we go live, click the bell button next to the subscribe button or check in at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We have helpful free content in the description below and on our website, a1trading.com. Thanks for watching today's video and we'll see you tomorrow.